America's number one movie star joins the big parade. James Stewart. He was literally unfit to fight in a way because he was so tall and so thin that uh, he was underweight and he kept failing the army medical. And so what he did, amazingly, was to deny himself bowel movements for, for something like two or three days just so that he would be heavy enough to pass the medical. I think he truly felt that this was his duty to his country, to serve. After Dad passed away, I found a piece of writing he'd done during the war. And all through it, he referred to it, he said, when I used to be an actor. Hollywood film star James Stewart is now a captain in the Air Force. Interviewed in Britain, he had this to say about his wartime job. I'm very proud to be here, and I'm going to do my best to be useful as a soldier in the United States Army. I, I think that whole experience, that whole military experience that I had is is something that I think I think about almost every day, and that it's one of the great experiences of my life. Greater than being in the movies? Yeah, yeah, much greater. Jimmy was almost ready to give up acting. He really thought it wasn't a very important uh, profession anymore. Once Lionel Barrymore said to to Mr. Stewart, he said, "Oh, you think." Flying over cities and dropping bombs on women and children is a is a proper sort of business to be in. You know? And I think really brought that home to Jimmy a little bit. When he returned to civilian life in 1945, Colonel James Stewart had flown 20 bombing missions over occupied Europe. He was one of the very few Hollywood stars to have faced real danger. Although almost uniquely qualified to do so, Stewart only ever made one military film. Anthony Mann's Strategic Air Command. I think he felt doing a war film was too close to his heart, too, too close to what had happened there, and he couldn't accurately depict it. I don't know, but um, he didn't talk very much about the war at all. I think he was very affected by it. Americans of Stuart's generation had not really been exposed to horrors until the war, and I think that for many people, uh, you can see it as a turning point in what they were capable of, in what they understood about the world. And Stuart is a different person after the war. In his most famous role, Stuart played George Bailey, a man on the brink of despair, who meets his guardian angel and is shown that his life has been worthwhile. There was a great sense that he was trying to find his feet again, both, both emotionally and in terms of his career, when he came to make It's a Wonderful Life. And going back to making a film with Capra, obviously, was in a way, a way of retracing his steps and, and getting back to what he considered to be the most successful phase of his pre-war career. Frank Capra, I think, could bring something out of Dad that no other director could bring out. And he, was, he loved Frank Capra and respected him so greatly. He says it's the chance of a lifetime. Now, you listen to me. I don't want any plastics, and I don't want any ground floors, and I don't want to get married ever to anyone. You understand that? I want to do what I want to do. And you're... And you're... Oh, Mary. Oh, George, George, George. Mary. I see it, and I weep to this day when I see it. And I've seen the damn thing, I don't know how many times. But you can't, you can't not get involved with those characters and his character. Well? Mother. Mother, what do you want? Mother, this, this is George. I... You see uh, Jimmy's face in that sequence. You don't see that face in most 
uh, most of his films. I mean, that's almost like out of one of his Hitchcock films or something. Though Mr. Smith is a very flashy performance, there's no doubt, and of course with the end scene and everything. But uh, there's, it's a much more complex performance in It's a Wonderful Life. It's a Wonderful Life occupies this, exactly the same place in the James Stewart canon as, say, A Christmas Carol occupies in the, in the Charles Dickens canon. Of course, it has a special place in all our hearts, but uh, nobody, I think, would seriously claim that A Christmas Carol is, is Dickens' greatest book, and nobody would, I think, claim that It's a Wonderful Life is James Stewart's greatest performance. This is a story about a failure. It's a Wonderful Life is about a person who fails to do what he wants to do and basically sacrifices his life for other people so that they can do what they want to do. And as a result of that, at the end of his life, he thinks he's failed because on paper he has and then realizes that his life has been meaningful to other, in other ways than he would have thought or than he would have wanted. Well, that's not, you know, something that maybe the country was interested in, in 1945. The picture was maybe ahead of its time. Even though it has this great ending, it still was a long way to go to get to that great ending, and there's a lot of pain involved to get there. And I guess that just, that was a little too much for, uh, for audiences. After all, it was the peak of optimism. The war had ended, we were the, America was the leader of the free world. It was a kind of a moment of tremendous op optimism and, and surged, you know, into things like On the Town um, and American in Paris, this kind of post-war ebullience. The picture did actually earn some Academy Award nominations, so it was paid attention to, but it just didn't have the real smash hit audience that they were looking for. Just as the, f the film is crucially important in American film history, it's Stewart's performance that uh, showed what he could do. He had never done anything like that sort of crack up until then. And I think it's obvious that Anthony Mann and Hitchcock both were affected by having seen that film and they, they learned what Stewart could do from that film.